because this is the last Sunday in August, this is the last Sunday of this kind of little sermon series I've been doing for the month on passages that are not in the lectionary reading. Uh, and so it, it came down to two from Acts that I was debating on. This is the one that I chose. Uh, you might see why in a moment. I think this is probably one of the funniest stories in the Bible. Um, also, I want to share this with you. I was sick earlier this week, and my brain did not function for about two and a half days. So I this might be the stinker, Gail. I don't know. I apologize ahead of time for the sermon. The good news for you all is the sermon's shorter than normal. <laughs> which is slightly ironic given the text. Uh, it is from Acts, the 20th chapter, verses 7 through 12, and I invite you to listen to the word. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window, Began, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there are times in our lives where we can be so fixated on something that we don't notice other things happening around us. Even when those things that are happening could actually help us accomplish what we were focusing on in the first place. So when I was in college, well, he's still one of my best friends, but one of my best friends from college is, uh, stands about six foot seven, very tall guy, very large hands. And so he used to have fun. He would grab a hold of both of my, my hands with, with one of his. You know, and, and just hold on, and I'm trying to break away and break away. And this one time he did that, so he had both, and I managed to get my hand like this, and I'm prying, and I'm prying, and I'm trying to pry the hand off, and all of a sudden I realize that his fingers are not holding my wrist. But I'm still trying to pry his hand away. Of course, the minute I notice this, he immediately grabs a hold again and starts laughing. Point. I was so fixated on trying to get his hand free that I didn't notice that it was. <laughs> Boy, right? Today's story from Acts is, is one that's, that's not well known. How many of you have heard this story before? Anybody? A few people. But it's, it's not a well-known story. As I said, it's not in the, in, in the lectionary. And it's a short story. And it's often used as a, as a cautionary a uh, tale about the dangers of falling asleep during a sermon. <laughs> or used as a joke for pastors on why we need to preach shorter sermons. Boy. But this one happens, this particular story takes place where Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem. This is at the conclusion of his third missionary journey that's taken him to uh, such hot spots as Rhodes, Athens, Corinth, Antioch, Ephesus, where he started a riot. But he's on his way back. He stops in Troas, which is where he is now. And Paul wants to leave them with as much information, as much knowledge and wisdom as he can, because he doesn't know if he's going to ever see them again or not. And he won't. So this is Paul's final journey. The next one that Paul takes will be the journey that takes him to Rome as a prisoner. But Paul doesn't know that. He doesn't have any, any premonitions. There's no sense of foreboding uh, in terms of that. 
he just he doesn't know, or perhaps he's not planning to come back. And so he wants to leave the people with as much as he can. He has so much to share with them. And so he talks with them. And he talks. And he talks. And he talks. <laughs> until late in the night, which, let's face it, could put anybody asleep. They're all crammed in this upstairs room. And we're told, you know, there's at least three stories, right? They're up in that room. Remember this, heat rises. And they had a lot of lamps lit in the room because it was dark. And these oil lamps that they would use not only gave off light, but they gave off heat. So in a room full of people that's just getting hotter and hotter, and it's getting later and later, and Paul just keeps talking on and on and on and on. It's no wonder Eutychus fell asleep. Eutychus was smart enough or lucky enough or had good fortune enough to have gotten a seat in the window. There, at least, he could have gotten a little bit of fresh night air, but it's not enough to keep him awake. And when he falls asleep, he falls out the window. <laughs> Three floors down, and everybody thinks he's died. He was either knocked unconscious, or maybe he was still asleep. I don't know. But at this point, Paul does actually pause in his long oration and runs downstairs to see what has happened. Paul throws himself on the body, gathers him in his arms, declares that Eutychus is actually still alive, turns around, runs back up the stairs, and after a much-needed snack break, keeps talking with them until dawn. Paul had a lot to say. Now, this story is a bit of, of comic relief in the book of Acts. But I don't think that's why Luke includes it. Maybe, but I think he includes it for two other reasons, which are kind of connected to one another. The translation of the language can be kind of tricky in this one, but Eutychus is not dead. So they think he's died, but he's not actually dead. The, the, the language in the Greek tells us that. And, and the story doesn't even tell us whether or not he was injured in the fall, probably. But we don't know. We're not told that he was. Paul says he's still alive. There's, there's life in him. He's okay. And there's no mention in Luke of a healing happening here either. Just that they take the home boy home relieved that he's okay. And why that is important is that it reminds us that the story of the Acts of the Apostles is the story of how the Holy Spirit is at work through them, around them, and with them. It serves as a reminder that Paul is not Christ, is not Godlike, and that's important. Because there are a lot of places in our world where the misquoted, cherry-picked words of Paul have been elevated above anything Christ ever said. But Paul is human. And like any human, he can get so fixated on what he thinks is important that he doesn't notice what's going on around him. Or he doesn't notice the needs of others around him. In this case, the need for sleep, the need for a break. He doesn't see it until after a disaster happens. This boy has fallen out of the window. But when that happens, Paul does notice, and he responds. And that's the other point. Paul does respond. He may have been like the others and thought that Eutychus had died until he actually gets down there. And it's possible that the spirit using Paul does heal Eutychus of any injuries, but that couldn't have happened if Paul hadn't gone down the stairs to begin with. 
And there are so many times when we think that what we have to say or what we have to do or what we think is so important that we miss opportunities for the Spirit to work through us. We can be so determined in achieving a specific goal that we don't see how the Spirit may be moving us in a different way. We can be so entrenched in our own thinking, in our own thoughts, in our own head, that we don't see the ones in need around us. I think it was an act of the Spirit that made Paul notice, stop, and show care for Eutychus. What Paul had to share with the group was important, but not so important that Paul wasn't open to the Spirit's nudging. And I don't mean that the Spirit nudged Eutychus out the window. But Eutychus's plunge out of that window was not on the agenda. It was not part of the plan for the evening. Sometimes the Spirit just wants us to put the plan aside. To put the assumptions of what is important inside aside. To put our own egos aside so that we can show care for another. I'm going to tell a story on myself now. A couple of weeks ago, someone called the church at about 10, 15 Sunday morning wanting to talk to me. The first thing I felt was annoyance. Why would someone call, it was someone, by the way, who would know what time he had service, but why would someone call 15 minutes before the service is supposed to start Start and want to speak to the preacher. I'm a little busy. I decided I'd call back later in the afternoon. And then while I was trying to get into my robe, this thing takes a little bit of work, the person actually called again. I didn't get to the phone, but I thought, okay, if someone calls twice in about five minutes, there's something going on. So I tried to call back just to say, I'll call you back later when I had a chance to talk. And I didn't get the person. This is a side note to all of you, but you really need to set your voice mailboxes up on your phones. <laughs> so I couldn't get the person. But it was time for the service, off I went. And all through the service, I'm feeling annoyed. Because not only was it Sunday morning, we had jazz concert that afternoon, I had reading and a paper to finish, and now I'm wondering, was that annoyance I felt? Not the spirit keeping me from forgetting. Keeping me from being so fixated on everything else I needed to do that I would forget. So after worship and before the jazz concert, I paused. I took the time to call someone who was just having a really bad day and needed to talk to someone. It was a very good lesson in humility for me. A reminder that schedules and plans and things that I deem as, as important are not as important as another person. Now luckily, it did not take anyone falling out of a window for me to learn that or relearn that. But it was someone who was falling. How often do we miss the opportunities to show care for another because we think our plans, our schedules, our agendas, our lives are too important to pause? How many spirit moments have we missed because we're so fixated on ourselves or because it would have been inconvenient? And I think probably more than any of us would like to admit. So I said, this is a, a short sermon this morning. So maybe instead of rushing about after the service thinking, hooray, we have extra time to do whatever we need to do today, 
If we didn't have the all church luncheon, I was going to make a joke about getting to the restaurants before the Baptists, but <laughs> we have lunch here, right? <laughs> So why not, you know, why not pause, say, you know, pause. Maybe actually spend a little time hanging out with each other. And then when you go out today, maybe if you can, go slowly about the day. Pause. You may find that the Spirit has some opportunity for you a moment in which you can show care to another. Amen.